So welcome back everyone and today we are going to discuss about Aristophanes and old comedy and of course his comedy plays and which is like the cloud, Lysistrata, Wasp and Frog. So we have quite a lot of things to discuss today and I hope everyone is excited. So in our previous class we talked about uh, Sophocles, Euripides, Aeschylus and today we are moving to the we are moving to comedy right so first of all i would like to welcome all of you here and in this class we are going to talk about aristophane first and then all of his uh, comedy plays and remember that we are only focusing on the main main comedy that he has written so it start with the clouds then the wasp then lystrata lysistrata and we will eventually talk about the frogs right and at the end of the class, we have created two points also. For that, uh, we are going to discuss what analysis and themes. So it will include all of these threes in this uh, two separate points. But before that, I would like to talk about Aristophanes, right? So everyone is ready. Well, I'm excited to uh, you know know more about that comedy, especially uh, Aristophanes' old comedy, right? So first of all, that this, you know, Aristophane, who Fanes, who actually lived a long time ago, around 427 to 387 or 8 BCE. So he was like, you know, chilling in the same era as who Socrates and Thucydides. But he was a bit younger than Sophocles and Euripides. So this guy, uh, Plato came along later after his uh, after his, uh, Aristophanes right so Sophocles was as we know a comedy playwright and he cranked out you know a bunch of plays like he made at least uh, you can if you if I just numbered it it will be like 40 of them but only 11 survived today and they found some scraps of papers and stuff that suggest he had even more plays but they all got lost or something right so Again, especially what uh, people called him the father of comedy and the prince of ancient comedy. And they said, they said that he was super good at showing what life was like in ancient Athens. So he had this amazing talent for making fun of people. Uh, so you can say he was the first comedian, right? So Plato wasn't fan of him. So he thought Aristophane play, Aristophane's play called The Cloud was you know, mean and made things worse for Socrates, who got into big trouble and was sentenced to death. But, you know, there were there were other playwrights making fun of Socrates too. So he was not the only one. Back in Aristophanes' time, they had these festival you know, that we talked in our previous session where they put on plays. One was called the City Dionysia that we have also uh, talk about the Dionysia, Dionysian f festival and then also we talked about Dionysia play right in our previous class on Euripides and the other were also there it was also called Lenia that we have discussed in the introduction of the theater Greek theater right so here you know they would perform these plays and try to outdo each other to win the first play so it was kind of big deal at that time so Aristophane plays all about like making fun of society and people and other stuff so he liked to point out the silly things people did and make jokes about them so we don't know much about his personal life but plato once mentioned him in one of his book that symposium i i hope you all of you know about it so aristophane was a kind of you know funny guy who liked to make fun of people in his place so he was kind of big deal back then and his plays were all about showing how ridiculous people can be right so now we'll talk about uh, his plays i'll just mention the name here uh, and also one line description for it and here the four plays that you are seeing here four comedies they are very important and uh, and in fact, most of the universities, they ask you to read that too, right? And uh, of course, in our net exam, the they somehow they ask one or two from Greek ancient theater. If they won't ask directly, it will be something, you know, indirect question like where this particular work, uh, you know, 
was inspired from what Greek play? So these kind of questions might come. So that's why we'll just talk about uh, Aristophanes other play just simply and then we'll move on to the main topic. So Aristophanes was, you know, this like wrote serious funny plays and as we know we have only 11 of his plays that survive right so and especially they are kind of you know a gold if you can say that so beautiful written very comic and that will find out anyway so these plays were part of what they called old comedy so that's why he was called the father of old comedy or you can say father of comedy as well So, but by the 4th century BC, a newer and more sophisticated form of Greek comedy came. And can you guess what it is? It is new comedy and which was by Menander, right? So a newer and more sophisticated from Greek tra tragedy took over and with all these intricate plots and recurring characters. But here's the thing. These older comedies were seen as a kind of crude and unsophisticated by them. Even Aristotle, no? Uh, the, the guy who was kind of you know big philosopher at that time didn't think much of them but you know what these old plays have aged like fine wine they still you know feel fresh and relatable to us modern for especially us if you are reading right now these plays it's really good i mean if you get time of course you should read otherwise summary is enough anyway let me give you the rundown of aristophanes surviving plays right first we got the Arcanian, Acarnians from 425 BC, which was like all about making a peace treaty. Then there is the Knights, you know, which was 424 BC. It was published at that time, where he takes a swipe at this dude named Cleon. And in the Clouds, which was published in 423 BC, and it was uh, Aristophanes calls out who Socrates, who was like biggest philosopher at that time for his shady behavior and sophistry. And again, we'll just come up with the Wasp, which was published in 422 BC, and makes fun of who Athenian jury system and their obsession with lawsuit. So, moving on, we got another play called Peace. And that was published in 421 BC, which is all about that peace deal with Sparta. And we have the birds, which is also quite, you know, important sometime, which was published in 414 BC. And the birds actually build their own city in the sky and outshine the god. Then we have Lysistrata, which is quite funny. And also before we have mentioned about Lys Lysistrata many times, right? Uh, in our previous classes in tragedy but Lysistrata was there in as a tragic form but here it's completely opposite what happened here this was first actually published in 411 BC or it was performed not published that is a wrong word anyway it is a kind of real gem it's all about you know women from all over Greece going on a sex strike to force their men to make peace so it's like you know girl power at that time anyway so then there is the uh, another play called the poet and the woman uh, or in uh, latin it was called thesmo for years you something like that i can't say properly but anyway uh, you just know the english name of it the poet and the woman which was published in 411 bc so what happened here here in this one a woman have a debate about getting rid of euripides so again we have another play the frogs where uh, which was published 405 BC and it was kind of you know also very funny play because here they he mentioned that Dionysus himself visit the underworld and judge who a poetry competition between Aeschylus and Euripides so it's kind of epic and it's very funny very hilarious so anyway next we move to the another is uh, the Excelsior something like Excelsior something related to that but anyway it was published in 392 so here's what happened again. It's about women. Women take charge of Athens and make everything communal. So finally, we have another play, Plutus, or we can call it Wealth. It was published in 388 BC. And it tells the story of the god Wealth remaining his side and no longer randomly distributing riches. So this is all about the play. Now we know there were also other plays that didn't survive, right? So one of these plays were like the Banqueters and again Plutus. Plutus and so this will this is not important for you anyway so this is all about Aristophanes life and all we'll just move straight to the cloud right I hope uh, 
you're excited i'm pretty excited about it let's see what happens there so do you see here the picture it is about the cloud and you know who was mentioned here there was socrates right you see socrates here with the long weird thing so we'll just move so this play is a kind of modern uh, you know it's a attack on especially modern education and morals as important or important and taught by the radical intellectuals known as the sophisties so the main victim of the play is that you know the athenian legend at that time socrates who was a famous teacher right and here we'll just know all the funny things what is happening how he mocked uh, socrates and his thought of in education and other things so this play the cloud right it's basically a hilarious take on the intellectual trend at that time in cl classical athens but guess what when it was first performed in 423 bc people didn't really you know understood in the beginning it actually ended up last out of three plays competing at the festival that year right and i you know what was the festival that is right so anyway aristophanes didn't give up he revised the play between 420 to 417 bc again and passed it around in written form unfortunately we don't have the original version anymore but what do we have right now is this revised ver version and but even that is said to be incomplete compared to the old school comedy style uh but hey, when we read translation or watch modern performance based on that we don't really notice uh, the missing bits because uh plots are there in tragedy it's straightforward they usually start with the oracle and then we know what is going to happen so you won't even notice that we have even i mean miss anything anyway looking back the clouds is considered the first comedy of ideas remember that and so we'll just move you know so remember that actually we were discussing about the context so the cloud is considered you remember the first comedy of ideas so in the world that still exists so literary critics thinks it's one of the best example of the genre but here's the thing it caused a quite you know uh, mess around that because it made fun of who socrates plato was even mentioned mentions the play in his apology as one of the things that led to socrates trial and execution quite a reputation for this play right anyway now we'll move to the uh characters so you see the list of the character first comes that strepsiades and uh strepsiades maybe that's how we say but anyway he's uh, this he's also athenian who's totally stressed out because his son and his son is phidipides phidipides actually phidipides racked up a ton of death deaths so this uh strip strepsiades what isn't actually a, exactly a hero he's more of an anti-hero who just wants to avoid taking responsibility for his death and he's not the sharpest tool in the shed and drives socrates and the other students crazy with his stubborn violence and literal thinking so he's a kind of down to earth guy who prefers beating people up or indulging in some alone time right so he's like a complete opposite of socrates so again uh, this uh, phidipides which is a uh, strepsiades son who's very rich who was very rich in fact an arrogant guy who thinks he's all that he tries to act like you know all high and mighty like his posh mom and uncle and he's obsessed with who horses and thinks he's a genius and his egotism makes him what mean and heartless especially towards the other so he's not a kind of good character there again now we have the socrates who's kind of you know hero or the main dude in this play so he's so like he has this no fancy school so uh socrates is all about this new education stuff teaching rhetoric science and uh, you know all other areas philosophy so he's like the principle of intellectualism at that time detached from the real world in ethan so that's what the you know that's what uh 
you know the funny thing in the play is so but don't be fooled socrates gets angry and impatient especially dealing with strepsiades who he thinks is a total idiot and again we have the character the chorus and the clouds here it's a kind of funny thing now huh? these guys are like the personification of rain and thunder so they're like a core voice in the play explaining his stuff and stirring things up sometimes they even act like prophets predicting what's going to happen so in tra in tragedy it was like tiresias and the oracle right this time these guys are you know acting like prophets predicting what's going to happen so they can just talk to the audience directly and give off this divine vibe so they are pretty much mouthpieces for the playwright or you can say aristophanes mouthpiece for unjust argument that is another character unjust argument so this character actually represent all the bad stuff about sophistry and the new education thing so he's like socrates what nemesis just like phidippides he's a smug and doesn't care about tradition or value he's clever with words but not so up right in his morals we have just argument so remember unjust argument just argument so as you have you must have read about socrates you know that he talked about argument and all these things so here they talk about he has i mean aristophanes mentioned unjust argument just argument and if you have read, uh, read plato's republic you must have understand that justice was there in and topic right and there was socrates another two character who were talking to each other so this just argument is the opposite of unjust by the name we can understand and it represents the old school way of education he is all about obedience respect for elders and the old poems and physical fitness but just like strepsiades he has got his own flaws particularly his excessive sexual desire that make him look like a foolish creep then we have a student right so this guy is student just my name is mentioned there this guy is you know who was actually student at socrates school and he shows what strepsiades how things work there so he's all serious about socrates scientific investigation and keeps everything secret and mysterious so he's pretty neurotic and offensive when strepsiades shows up trying to maintain the order and importance of their school now we have first creditor here so he's kind of very angry athenian who you know strepsiades owes money so he's all about the details and follows the proper procedure he's not thrilled about taking his steps he adds to the court but he's determined and organized we have second creditor creditor so this guy is kind of opposite like first creditor is like angry here this guy is very sad gloomy athenian who steps he adds owes money to as well so he's always you know mopping around and making pathetic oaths to the god so he's like Yeah, he's like a Greek version of Eora from Winnie the Pooh, right? So, again, Xanthias, another character is Xanthias. So, this guy, he is actually Strep's, you know, Strep's Yeri's household slave, and he's obedient most of this most of the time, but would you know would not hesitate to stand up for him for himself if he is challenged. Again, now we have Cariophone. So, this guy, he's also a philosopher. from socrates school so he's known for being pale and super intellectual but he is also whiny and helpless again now we have students so this is a kind of group of socrates pupil blindly following you know socrates knowledge so they are like pale silent and not exactly physically fit so they are like the typical moony brainy type so this is all about character uh now we'll just move to the plot and here is the short summary of everything in just uh, pointers so you can read it anyway you'll get the pdf at the end of the class so it is starts with this guy named strepsiades and he's really stressed out because of his son because of his son's debt actually yeah and what is his name the his son is Fidi pities spends way too much money on uh, you know horses race horses strips he is constantly because he's very uh, worried about the death he's you know that he has and because of his son's expensive hobby so what he decides he decides 
that you know one one night he's that uh, strips yeris calls a slave to bring him his financial records and he gets so angry when he sees how much money he owns that he wakes up you know in angry he was angry and he wakes up who fiddy fiddies and that is strips yeris the father actually pleads with his son to stop spending so recklessly and suggests that he should enroll in the new school called that socrates school right and he thinks maybe phidipides can learn some fancy sciences and clever arguments to help them outsmart their creditors in court but that stubborn phidipides refuses leaving strepsiades to take matters into in his own on hands right now here we are talking about socrates so as Strepsiades decides to enroll in the school himself because his son was not ready, so he did. So when he gets there, he meets a student who tells him about Socrates and his strange experiments with insects and astronomy. So the student shows Strepsiades the other student who are studying in some weird positions, using their faces for geology and their, you know, behind behinds for astronomy. while they are looking at maps socrates appears in balloon basket hanging in the air apparently what happened this contraption helps him clear his mind and he and be open to new ideas and the chorus here so like strepsiades explains his problem to socrates and ask for guidance and socrates starts you know and lighting him by trying to prove that the gods don't exist and that vada patterns are controlled by a group of clouds socrates even manages to trick strips you know uh, that is strips yaris and takes his coat leaving him feeling even more confused meanwhile while strips yaris is away now the chorus of cloud that chorus of clouds defends the play so, you know sings and uh defending the play and criticizing the audience for not appreciating it earlier so the play is the playwright's moral uh, moral intention and the lessons the satire teaches during troubled time so now what happens now again eventually socrates and strepsiades come back and what they did will be funny and they have a discussion about the gender of nouns Socrates put puts no strips yaris in a bed infested with you know lies to make him think so so that guy strips yaris goes through a lot of agony and then he starts sharing his ridiculous theories on how to win his court case Socrates gets frustrated and calls him a useless student the chorus of cloud convinces uh, strips yaris to send his son to the school instead then what happened uh now this strepsiade then comes back and he sends his son to the school so what he did uh, after all these experiment that he was in agony of pain and then all happened strepsiade is rushes back to home and he starts testing you know fide fides with his new found knowledge and sophistry he drags actually his son to the school were two argument there was two argument right just and unjust debate about proper way to educate boys just suggest a traditional education based on poetry and physical fitness but he gets overwhelmed by his own desires unjust then there is another guy unjust right unjust easily dismantle just argument using myth and trivia just is completely flustered and unjust wins who phidipides uh, as a pupil now again the chorus of clouds hints that you know steps he had is forcefully educating phidipides will be his downfall and then they turn to the audience trying to persuade bribe and even threaten them for their approval of the play so the day the day at the court steps he had is prepares for his court case and you will be you know surprised to see what actually happened 
so the day of uh, strepsiades at court case approaches right so he goes back to pick up who phidippides from his school socrates assures him that phidippides has learned their brand you know brand of bogus learning or bogus learning which is actually phidippides quickly demonstrate when he criticizes a common saying as paradox so strepsiades is thrilled that his son is perfect example of unjust argument but then two creditors shows up and these creditors demand payment from strepsiades and the first one actually demand that strepsiades appear in court and strepsiades try to outsmart him by quizzing him about the gender of noun he refuses to pay the debt claiming that creditor is ignorant the second creditor then arrives begging strepsiades and wringing his hands strepsiades again berates him for believing in the gods and uses the unjust argument to deny any responsibility for the debt he even beats the second creditor until he runs away now again the chorus uh, appeared and they you know you know they sings a song of warning that strepsiades on bad deeds will come back to haunt him and sure enough as their song ends the strepsiades burst out of his house being beaten you know beaten by beaten by phidippides and they are arguing about reciting traditional poetry so phidippides defends his beatings using sophistry and strepsiades realizes that he's traded his son's obsession with expensive horses for an obsession with fancy argument which also has its consequences so here at the end what happens actually strepsiades blames chorus so the blames chorus of you know cloud these chorus of clouds for leading him astray but they defend themselves saying that their deception taught him a lesson strepsiades admits he was wrong but still wants to get revenge on socrates and the school so he calls his slave now that character that we have mentioned xanthes xanthes and together they run to the school and set fires to the roof people inside like you know carry phone there was carryo phone and the second student shout and rush out as the building burns and strepsiades celebrate his revenge and chases off the remaining students by throwing rocks now at the end chorus again the crowd you know take some moment to assess the situation and then leaves the scene so that is whole, all about uh, clouds so now you can understand how they were making fun about socrates especially in the cloud so remember that that question comes not once but many time it has uh, you know appeared in your exam anyway now we'll just talk about uh, we'll move to the wasp quickly so wasp as as you know it was published in 422 bc uh, it is by aristophanes and wasp actually satirizes what litig litigiousness of the athenians who were represented by the mean and waspish old man which his name was philocleon love cleon who has a passion for serving on juries so to simplify simplify this we'll just move to the context and see so there's this play called wasp right and which was performed ba way back in 422 bc and it was during a you know break from the peloponnesian war uh in athens it was like big big war at that time it was happening in athens so people were probably looking for some entertainment right so now aristophanes had a thing for making fun of this guy named cleon so cleon was kind of you know gen general and a big shot in Athens and you might have seen this character in so many tragedies as well right and we have already discussed about Cleon before but here uh, Aristophanes wasn't too fond of him in this play what happened he takes the opportunity to mock Cleon and also poke fun at the legal system which gave Cleon a lot of power basically Aristophanes what happened he uses humor to highlight the absurdities and flaws of Cleon and the court system it's what they called old comedy right as we know him as the father of old comedy where they didn't hold back in making fun of an important people and institution so that was the context there are character remember anticleon uh, which is a young athenian then we have procleon which is full you know philocleon his father 
then we have so so she has their household slave then we have xanthias another household slave first dog a reveler a baking woman and a surgeon so this is all about uh, the character here now we'll move to the plot all the plots here is on in the you know uh, in pointers form you can get it after the class so anyway let's start so all right so the play starts with pretty weird scene there's a big net covering a house the entrance is blocked and two slaves named xanthius and sosius are sleeping on the street outside there is also uh, a guy perched on the wall but he's snoozing too turns out the slaves are guarding a monster and which happens to be master's father and what's this old man addicted to not gambling or booze if you're expecting but the law court he's a real you know trial of oil his name's philocleon and his son you know bidicleon has turned their houses into a prison to keep him away from those court rooms so that this guy uh that this guy decleon bd lecleon anyway we'll just move wakes up and wants the slaves to be on their toes because his father is staring he tells them to watch out for him you know in sneaking through the drains but you know but surprise you know what happened philocleon pops out of the chimney pretending to be smoke luckily that the guy which name starts with b right bd creon pushes him back inside there uh, there are a few more unsuccessful attempts to you know for escape and then the chorus arrives these guys are like old jurors trudging around trudging through the muddy streets with young boys guiding them with lamps when they find out about their old buddy being in prison they you know rally to his defense and swarm around that bd creon and the slaves it's a whole chaotic scene but eventually they all agree to settle things peacefully through a debate so the debate between you know Phil, uh, that philocleon and bidicleon focuses on the perks the old man gets from being a voluntary juror so philocleon loves the attention from rich and powerful folks who want to fa- you know who want a fa- favorable verdict the freedom to interpret the law as he pleases since his decision can't be reviewed and the money he earns as a juror uh, gives him authority in his own household but by the clown counters with the argument that jurors actually have to do what pretty officials or you know tell them and they don't get paid what they deserve so most of them bias the riches go into the pockets of guy like clown so these argument hit philocleon hard and even the chorus starts to side with bidicleon the like cleon but philocleon refuses to give up his old ways so that guy with the b name right comes up with a plan and he offers to turn the house into court room and pay his father's a juror's fee to settle domestic dispute so philocleon philocleon agrees and they quickly brings a case before him and one dog accuses the other of stealing sicilian cheese and not sharing it now the witness are you know inanimate objects like a ball a pestle a, you know a cheese grater a brazier and even a pot obviously they can't speak so bidicleon on speaks for them defending the accused dog so here uh, they are the evidence rights and they he is speaking as they are so then a bunch of you know the bunch of adorable puppies comes and these babies are brought in to tug at philocleon's heartstring with their cute cries but guess what philocleon is not moved however his son tricks him into putting his boot in the urn for acquittal the old man is shocked by the outcome and he is used to convincing people but his son promises him a good time and they leave the stage to get ready for some fun while they are off stage uh, the chorus talks directly to the audience in a traditional para phrases and they praises the 
playwright for his standing up to the guys like Cleon and has called the audience for not appreciating the writer, writer's previous play, which was The Clouds, right? And they also admire the older generation reminisce over about the victory of Marathon and complains about corrupt fox gobbling up the empire's riches, father and son return, now arguing about what the old man should wear. So he's addicted to his old jewelry man's cloak and shoes and doesn't trust the fancy clothes and his stylish Spartan footwear. That the guy named with P. Right, Biddy Cleon, wants him to wear to a fancy dinner party. But of course, these fancy clothes win and Biddy Cleon teaches his dad the right manners and conversation for the party. So at the party, Philoc Cleon declares he you know, he doesn't want to drink any wine. It only causes trouble and he claims uh, that Biddy Cleon assures him that sophisticated guys like them can talk their way out of trouble easily. So they go optimistic about this. And anyway, then there is a second para basis or you can call it a break where the chorus briefly briefly mentions a conflict between Cleon and playwright. After that, a slave from the house comes and gives the audience the scoop on the old man's terrible behavior at the dinner party. And, Phil and Philo Cleon got himself embarrassingly drunk, insulted all of his son's fashionable friends, and now he's causing trouble for everyone he meets on their way home. On the way home. And the slave leaves, and Philo Cleon arrives with angry victim, chasing him, and a pretty, you know, flute girl on his arm. Then that Biddy Cleon shows up a moment later, gives his father a piece of his mind for kidnapping, kidnapping the flute girl. But Philo Cleon tries to play it out like she's a torch. Obviously, his son isn't fooled and tries, you know, to forcefully take the girl back to the party. But his father knocks him down. More people arrive with complaints against Philocleon, demanding compensation and threatening legal action. So he sarcastically tries to talk his way out of the trouble like a sophisticated guy, but it only makes things worse. Finally, uh, Biddy Cleon, worried shit, drags his father inside the chorus briefly signs about how hard it is for people to change their habits and praises the son for his devotion to his father. Then the whole cast returns to the stage for some lively dancing by Philocleon in a contest with Sons of Carrie Seniors. So this is all about the plot. I hope you got it. But anyway, you should understand that in the frogs, he actually makes fun of, sorry, uh, Wasp. He is actually making fun of Cleon and also the judiciary and the law system. And then we have... Lysistrata. So, Lysistrata, as I told you, it's a quite funny play and it was published in 411 BC. And the context you can see here, uh, this Lysistrata by Aristophane, it was performed in 411 BC in Athens. And the play is all about this woman called Lysistrata and who comes up with a crazy plan to end the Peloponnesian War. And you won't believe it, what she does. She convinces all the women from the varying cities to stop having sex with their husbands and lovers. And you heard that right. And she figures if the guys are deprived of their favorite thing in the world. So they'll be like desperate enough to make peace. So this play is pretty awesome because it sheds light on the messed up dynamic between men and women in ancient time, in ancient Greek. Greece and it's a comedy so it's all about a good fun but it tackles some serious gender issues and get this it is also like game changer in terms of plays structure it breaks away from the usual format of the time which is pretty cool and also uh, that Lysistrata was performed right after Ethan's got its butt kicked in Sicilian expedition talk about bad timing but it's an interesting you know very entertaining and thought provoking play that still you know people talk about it so this is uh, the context now we'll move to the characters so here character we have the heroine here Lysistrata and this woman was like you know she had enough of war she was like fed off of war and how women are treated in Athens so she's like you know 
I'm not gonna take it anymore. So see what she does. She gathers all the women from Sparta and Athens and comes up with a plan to you know fix all these things. And guess what? It actually works. Lysistrata is not like you know typical girl. She's more like a strong, tough lady, and that's why the guys respect her. Right. And another character is here is Cleonian Cleonike. So that Cleonike uh, is actually Lysistrata's neighbor and she's all about embracing her femininity and gets super excited when Lysistrata's clan involves sexy clothes like Nigli, you know. And so that girl was very excited of that Lysistrata's plan. And again, we have uh, Marine, Maran, Marianne, Marianne, whatever you can say. So now, Lempiti, that Marianne. Marianne is another peaceful woman in Lysistrata crew. She knows how to play game. She seduces her husband. Uh, his name is Kinesius. But at the last moment, she's like, nah, no action for you. Talk about. So, so that is all. And now we have uh, another character named Lumpito. So this Lumpito is also a Spartan woman. And uh, she is kind of a you know, big and a strong lady. And you can imagine her with her. You know accent like things it's like she was from you know like different place so lampito brings the spartan girls into lysistrata's master plan again we have another character called uh, ishmania which is not mentioned here i guess so this character uh, takes care of herself and might and she's mute and let's not forget the korean thing that she's a girl from korean in the korean and that is policeman and also there is a commissioner, another character, police women, police women and police man. And again, peace. At the end, we have character named peace. So all of these characters are important. And now we'll move to the plot. Plot is quite funny and uh, I think everybody will understand. It's quite simple, not very complicated. So, uh, so this Lysistrata, who's like fed up with Peloponnesian war in Greece, she wants to put an end to all the fighting. So what she gathers all the women from different areas like Sparta, Thebes, Corinth, and for a meeting. Lys so that Lysistrata has this bold plan that she wants the women to refuse to have uh, sex with their husbands until a peace treaty is signed. So she even gets the older women of Athens called the chorus of old women on board with this idea so as they wait for everyone to assemble Lysistrata starts venting about how women are seen as weak but she's just determined to change all that finally all the women gather and Lysistrata manages to convince them to take an oath to withhold sex until peace is, peace is achieved they even celebrate uh, by sacrificing a bottle of wine to the gods while they're doing that they hear the sounds of the older women successfully taking control of the acropolis which is where the treasure treasury of athens is kept so it's a big moment for them then things get really interesting now the chorus of old men a group of elderly guy guys they show up with a you know, wood and fire to smoke the women out of the Acropolis. But, but guess what? The chorus of old women arrives with jugs of water to put out the men's fire. And they totally win the battle by pouring water over the men's head. It's all pretty hilarious, right? So what happened next? Next, this uh, commissioner guy who's like the government official at the time. So shows up at the Acropolis. He's looking for, uh, you know, funds for naval ships but gets surprised when he finds the women instead and he tries to order police men to arrest Lysistrata and the others but what policemen get scared of and like you know kind of funny physical fight and the commissioner takes the opportunity to complain about how men have given women too much freedom in Athens so after the chaos the commissioner and Lysistrata starts arguing about the war Lysistrata explained that the war is a concern for women too women too because they have sacrifices a lot for it they have lost the husbands and sons and even harder for women to find husbands now so as a joke they dress up the commissioner like a woman the next day or maybe sometime later 
the sex strike plan is starts affecting the men then this guy kinesius and a guy who was actually married to marian and comes to the acropolis desperately wanting you know his wife but marian refused to have sex with him until there's a peace between athens and sparta so she leaves she leaves uh, him a bit and pretending she might give in but keeps going back into the acropolis to fetch things and leaving him frustrated then a spartan herald shows up with the same problem he's got an you know and uh, begs for peace because he wanted his women and that another the delegation from both athens and sparta meet at the acropolis to discuss peace and all the men are you know still dealing with their uh, erections and lysistrata comes out with her handmade piece who's naked by the way while the men are distracted lysistrata lectures them about the need for reconciliation between the states so she refused she argues that since athens and sparta have a shared history and have like helped each other in the past they shouldn't be fighting so using peace as a map the leaders of athens and sparta work out a peace deal and guess what once they agree Lysistrata gives the women back to men when everyone celebrates like crazy. So the play ends with a song sung together by the chorus of old men and women while everyone dances. So in a nutshell, it's a wild story about how uh, Lysistrata and the women use a sex strike and like some clever tactic to bring peace to Greece. Peace to Greece. Anyway, uh, now we have the last play, which is... the frogs so why this frog is important because here aristophanes is actually making fun of euripides so it's a comedy that was written way back in 405 bc uh, and the story is all about dionysus who's the god of drama and he's feeling pretty you know fired up because he thinks the quality of tragedy in athens has gone to you know, low, I mean, downhill after his favorite playwright, Euripides, died. So Dionysus comes up with a plan. He decides to disguise himself as the hero Heracles and go down to the underworld and also known as the Hades to bring Euripides back to the land of the living. Sound crazy, right? But here's what it gets very interesting now. When Dionysus reaches to Hades, he sets up a competition between Euripides and another famous playwright, Aeschylus. So he wants to see who's the better writer and who can help Athens out of its trouble. So after watching their performance, Dionysus has a change of heart. He realizes that Aeschylus is the one who can make a bigger impact and help Athens, not Euripides. So he decides to leave Euripides behind and brings Aeschylus back to the land of the living. So that's the whole uh, plot about the frogs. Right, and uh, the characters here you can see uh, Dionysius uh, who goes to the underworld to bring Euripides back, but eventually he brings Aeschylus, right? Only because that he thinks that Aeschylus might change Athens. And again, another character is uh, Xanthius, and who's a Dionysius' slave. And again, the hero Heracles actually is the disguised form of Dionysius. And again, we have Cobbs, uh, then we have Sharon. Then Aeacus, Janitor, and Hedis made Hostus, Platane, made of the Inn, Euripides, of course, Aeschylus, Pluto, and various extras. So, anyway, this is all uh, about the character. Now we'll just move to the plot immediately. So, plot is uh, simple, I mean, not very complicated, simple that this Danisha seeks, you know, Euripides from the under, uh, underworld. And uh, this is all about that. But anyway, I'll just move it quickly because we have already I think over one hour so all right so this play the frogs here right we are talking about frogs which tells the story of the god Dionysius right and he he's like pretty disappointed with the tragic playwrights in Ethan so he decides to go to the underworld which is Hades where Hades lives to bring back the playwright Euripides from the dead so Dionysius take uh, you know takes his clever and brave slave named Xanthius along with the journey. So at the beginning, what happens? Dionysius and Xanthius argue about what kind of jokes uh, Xanthius can use to, you know, open the play. But here's the deal. Dionysius keeps messing up and making mistakes throughout the first half of the play. And Xanthius has to improvise to cover for him. 
and guess what dionysius never faces any consequences for his blunders right because he's the god so to so, so to find the way of the heat is dionysius asked his brother half brother heracles for advice so heracles had been to underworld before you know to get this scary dog called cerberus when dionysius shows up at heracles please dress like him it's pretty hilarious actually so heracles suggests three ways to get to hades quickly first is hanging himself second is drinking poison and the third is jumping out uh, jumping off a tower and dionysius decide to take the longer route that heracles took which involves crossing a lake so dionysius gets on a boat with a guy named sharon who you know who ferries him across the lake so poor jantius being a slave isn't allowed in the boat and has to walk around it while dionysius helps row row during this side there is a part where a chorus of frogs sings this annoying you know croaking refrain that really annoys dionysius so he ends so he ends up having a silly argument with the frogs when they finally reach to the shore dionysius reunites with the xanthias who scares him by pretending to see a scary monster called impusa next they meet aikis another character who mistakes dionysius for heracles because of his outfit so aikis is still mad at heracles for stealing cerberus so he threatens to send some monster after him so dionysius gets scared and swaps clothes with xanthias then a maid another maid come uh, comes along and thinks dionysius is heracles inviting him to feast with dancing girls xanthias happily takes on the role of heracles but dionysius quickly wants to trade back their clothes again quite funny right so things get even more confusing when more people starts getting angry at heracles with xanthias so the switch clothes for the third time when i when that aikis comes back to confront heracles actually dionysus right so xanthias offers what dionysus as a slave to be tortured to find out the truth and dionysus terrified reveals that he is a god and they all get whipped and dionysus is brought before the aikis master to verify the truth then this maid appears and starts flirting with you know flirting with xanthias interrupting their uh, conversation with preparation for a contest the maid talks about a conflict between euripides and aeschylus euripides who had recently died is challenging aeschylus for the title for the best tragic poet at a dinner with the ruler of the underworld was pluto and dinas the dinasus acts as the judge in a contest between two playwrights they take turns quoting verses from their plays and making fun of each other euripides argues that his characters are better because they are more realistic logical while aeschylus believes his uh, idealized characters are better because they are heroic and virtuous so they keep teasing each other with funny quotes and parodies from their works to settle the debate they have to put a few lines into a balance and the heavier lines win aeschylus wins with his verses about heavy heavy stuff like a river death crash chariot and dead charioteers so dionysius still can't decide who to bring back to life so he asks them for advice on how to save the city euripides gives clever but meaningless answer while aeschylus provides practical advice so in the end dionysius chooses aeschylus because of his helpful advice so pluto allows aeschylus to return to life and they all have a final round of drinks before saying goodbye aeschylus suggests that sophocles should take his seat while he's gone not euripides right so this is all about uh the frogs and now we'll just move to the themes quickly we'll see the themes uh here themes of satire and social commentary aristophan plays are known for their biting satire and commentary on society politics and influence figures of his time and he used humor to criticize more criticize and mock the flaws and absurdities he observed in athenians so right and again we have political theme which is also important because aristophane often you know targeted politician right leaders and institutions in his plays he exposed their corruption incompetence and hypocrisy through exaggeration comical character it was his way of holding them accountable and highlighting the flaws in the political system then we have war and peace theme many of aristophanes plays revolve around the theme of war and the desire for peace so he's presented the devastating effects of war uh, its futility and the need for diplomatic solution 
peace was often depicted as desirable and beneficial state for society then we have gender which is quite important you can see in uh, that playwright uh, aristophanes frequently explored themes related to gender roles sexuality and the battle of the sexes power and corrup corruption is another theme then we have chorus and music you, you have already seen that how chorus and music uh, you know are really important to form a play they especially move the play forward right then again fantasy uh, parody and literary illusion fantasy and absurdities we have symbolic characters and mask freedom for speech and intellectual freedom so this was all about themes now uh, analysis we'll just move to the analysis quickly and see so aristophanes as we know is a greek playwright known for his hilarious play which were a part of genre called old comedy right and uh, to really get his plays and what they were all about so it's helpful to understand old comedy and where aristophanes fit into so old comedy was all about entertaining a diverse audience it had a mix of serious messages like light light-hearted humor catchy song clever wordplay naughty jokes and a unique structure so they didn't shy away from being absurd and fantastical so it's like you know kind of alice in wonderland or plays from the theater of absurd so the themes of old comedy were like crazy you know but they followed their own logical rule they took everyday situation exaggerated them them to the ridiculous ridiculous extreme for example in arrest of uh, the frogs that we have discussed right the main character dionysius wears a crazy outfit with a women's tunic buskin boots and a lion skin cape all the some you know more funny absurd reason so the heroines in arrest of play were also resourceful and independent and they were clever and always found a way out of tough situation so they were like a mix of odysseus from homer's story and the smart farmers from hesoid works <coughs> now this is all about analysis and that's all guys i hope uh, you have now a general idea about old comedy and especially aristophanes uh, and we know now we all know about the cloud lysistrata wasp and frogs so that's all guys and i'll see you tomorrow tomorrow this is our uh, end of greek theater where we'll be discussing about menander and his new comedy and after that we'll immediately move to the uh, if there is a roman play we'll talk about roman plays otherwise we'll just move straight to the shakespeare time right so that's all thank you so much and i'll see you tomorrow bye bye